thank you everybody for joining and welcome. Um, you know, we are having this meeting uh, in the context of the um, Agile 20 Reflect Festival. And <laughs> I have a kind of similar. Um, and the festival is going around uh, for almost uh, entire February already. Uh, because of the 20th anniversary of the manifesto. So thank you, Alistair, for having this second round, this time in English, of getting back a little bit in time with history and stories about what happened in these last three decades that you've been working uh, to get to the Asia Manifesto. And, uh, and we're going to uh, divide this uh, this kind of interview more like a storytelling moderated with some questions in pre-manifesto time, the manifesto meeting itself, what happened there in the snowboard, and what the future or what is, what is happening after that agile, um, famous agile meeting. So let's go to the pre-manifesto meeting. Sure, let's What's talk, about, let's talk that. about that. So uh, this is my third time doing this, actually. I did the first one was um, in Spanish. So uh, if you have any Spanish-speaking friends, I did the whole thing in, in Spanish uh, about a week ago. And then I had an opportunity to do it uh, actually twice in, in um, English, I think, once uh, for the Norwegian Agile crowd and once for the Washington, D.C. Agile crowd. And uh, so in a sense, I've... I've Practice a little bit. What are the questions that tend to come up? But um, throw some questions in the chat, and Solo will will watch for those and, and fit those in. So here's here's what's on my mind, and it'll be like you know I'll spend most of the time, maybe even like half an hour on the '90s, uh, because really so few people know that, and I kind of want to get my knowledge of that on record, and then a bunch of time on you know maybe 15 minutes or something like that on the the meeting itself, again, my recollection of that, and the smallest amount of time on, on what's happened since. It's really, you know, it's an opportunity to put on the record at least my section of the knowledge of all the stuff that led up to that. My story started in, in 1991, um, and so for me, the meeting in 2001 was was a sum up of the previous 10 years of, of work, and, and I got my PhD dissertation out of that work uh, in 2003, but I started writing it in uh, around uh, 99 or 2000. So, so those things were for me, like the, the publication of my Agile Software Development book, the writing of the manifesto and the PhD were all kind of a, a big lump, a wrap up of what happened in the 90s. Um, so I'm gonna go over that in some amount of detail. There's three threads that I want to be very, very clear about that came together at the meeting because the meeting was extraordinary in a, in a way that no other meeting has been that I've ever been to in my life. And I think it was the, the, the joining of those three threads it, that made it somehow uh, particularly interesting and particularly different. And I say like all the time, all the time, all the time, there were 17 people in the meeting Nobody takes any special credit for anything that happened in the meeting. Uh, what's really wonderful is all of the people who, who actually maybe suggested anything we used have never come forward to say that they were the person who just suggested um, that, you know, whatever the, the, the word agile or the structure that we used or anything. And that's because they're all very conscious of the fact that we had 17 strong-minded people in the room. And it didn't matter, like in a brainstorming session, you know, everybody's popping words out. It doesn't really matter who pops a word out, 17 people have to agree that that word, that construct, that something suits them. So everything was a full construct of 17 people. So like I say that over and over and over again. And and Sole, if you've got spare capacity, because I, I might not, um, did I send you or shall I send you if I haven't already, I could take, and send you a picture of the plaque that they just put up in Snowbird? Do, do you have that? I, Put that on yes. Facebook and Twitter, and I could I could grab it if you need me. Um, but what's cool about that? It has the seventeen names and not the words of the manifesto, and that's actually going up in the room in Snowbird, so people can go get that. So with that in mind, you know what I'm going to tell you is what I knew of the um, 
the conversations, the what I a network of conversations that preceded the meeting that permitted the meeting to meet to be what it was. And I was party to some number of those conversations, and I was not party to some number of those conversations, and other people were. But I'll give you at least the table of contents as I have it. And the three parts were were the patterns movement, uh, the wood conferences, and the people doing lightweight um, methodologies and processes in the 90s. And, and they all kind of like happened at the same time. So my personal journey, I was living and working uh, in Switzerland for IBM in 1990, and I needed to come back to the U.S. Um, so I got a job with the newly, there we go, thank you. So uh, um, I got a job with a newly constructed IBM consulting group, um, and, in, and they were looking for a methodology and a process for projects that were going to be using uh, Smalltalk and C++, so object-oriented programming languages. And they had a very nice methodology that was incremental, iterative, client-centric, tailorable, like really way ahead of its time for 1991. And all they needed was to have the small talk and C++ parts plugged in. But when I looked at it, none of the, the object-oriented database, none of that stuff would plug in because of the structure of objects. We didn't have the same roles. We didn't have that thing. So I said to my my boss, I said, well, I, I got all the books, you know, the books at the time, Jim Rumbaugh book, um, Eva Jakobsen's book, Stephen um, Schlermeller's book, and significantly, as will show up, um, a Rebecca Wirsbrock book, uh, Designing Object-Oriented Software, because she was there. I want to say that her book was already out, and it was what I learned from in the early 90s. And when you ask why weren't women at the, at the, um, the workshop, she should have been there. Um, and that was, a, that was just a bad mistake. So she was already there, and I'll keep referencing uh, her, Ward Cunningham, Kent Beck, um, and Martin Fowler, like over and over and over again in these conversations. Anyway, so my boss said, I said, I got the books. They all disagree. I don't know anything about methodology. Like, what should I do? And she said this, like these famous words. And she said, we don't have any competing products in the space. Um, we just want something that works. How about you go and interview some projects and find out what works and doesn't work? And just we'll just write that down. And I said, okay. So I started, she gave me unlimited airplane tickets, and I flew literally all over the world. I flew to Sweden to study under Ivar Jakobsen and his use cases. I flew to New Zealand to interview a project that was doing a thing called Sapient, which was a kind of a reflective, meta-reflective mainframe uh, system that worked on 3270 terminals. I went up to Toronto. I went up to Minneapolis. I interviewed IBM labs in different places. And, and it became very clear very quickly that there were thousands of ways to fail and not very many ways to succeed. So I restricted all of my interviews to, to, to two questions. The project had to deliver, and I didn't say deliver on time, on budget, like literally deliver. Like the bar is really low here, just deliver. And the second question that caused the most uh, difficulty was I said, and the team has to be willing to work the same way Again, and I didn't say happy to, I didn't say delighted, I just said willing, literally willing to work the same way again. And I can't tell you the number of people who said, hey, Alistair, come interview our projects. And I said, did the project deliver and the people are willing to work the same way again? And they would like hear the second question and they'd go, oh, 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 no, no, maybe, maybe, maybe never mind. And I'm going like, if the people aren't willing to work the same way again, why am I, why am I interviewing? What, what is this as a way of working, right? That the people are... You have a successful project, but the people are not even willing to work the same way again. Right? Why am I interviewing? So, so that really, you know, shrank the number of, of projects that I interviewed. A giant one that I interviewed was the Brooklyn Union Gas Project. Uh, uh, but that one just worked so well, I couldn't learn anything because I was, a, you know, if, if a person just does everything right from the beginning, you, you, can't, you can't tell what they did. So the ones I learned from were the ones that were like, failed and then recovered and, and and that was really interesting so 91 to 94 92 I wrote the first um, methodology for IBM and it all it had was use cases CRC cards incremental development and v versioning con 
So the only tool there was a versioning system, right? So that was in 92. And I decided I would make the error of omission, that is say I would leave everything out. I, I didn't want to have to recant, right, on a, on, on a recommendation. I wanted to just like get it right. I said, okay, if you have incremental development and you use use cases for requirements and you use CSC cards for design and you have a versioning tool, you know, then then I don't know, then you're going to be okay, right? Then we can add stuff. And in 93, I added patterns because the patterns was just coming out in 93 and, and stuff like that. So that was in 92. So that was my start and everything that I basically have to say comes out of project interviews. So my crystal clear methodology um, is, is literally, I've never used it myself. I literally ha wrote down and said, people say, if you do this, it works. And I wrote it down in a book. And the book basically says, put six people alone in a room, give them access to the customer, deliver and reflecting, all will be good. And it works like, People write to me and say, yeah, I did that and it works. Like that's no time boxes, no sprints, no nothing. Like just, just do that. Um, and that's crystal, that's crystal clear in a, in a nutshell. Um, so anyway, that's, that takes me. So I was then in 94, we had our first real project uh, with Ralston Purina, fixed price, fixed time, 18 month, $10 million, 50 people, 12 small talk programmers, which was huge at the time. Nobody, nobody knew what to do with 12 small talk programmers. Uh, we had DBAs, um, you know, DB2, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and we, guess what? We had three-month increments. We did not use time boxes. We had two demos per delivery. Um, we did everything. And, and I lived out of my stories because all I had was stories. We didn't know anything. So, you know, and then we failed and then we fixed that. We used the stories to change this and we came up, we invented cross-functional teams for ourselves and, you know, we invented stuff and we used everything. And we came out successfully at the end, delivered after, after 18 months, much to my surprise. And a lot of the other projects were failing. And, and, and basically we did what I came to be called Crystal Orange, in which we had, you know, 50 people and a couple of different technology teams. But it was all communication centric, right? All I knew was everybody had to talk with everybody and you had to like just just iterate and cycle and fix and then ship every three months, right? That's all, that's all I knew. And that became called Crystal Orange. So that was 94, 95. Now at the same time, 94, 95, the Scrum guys, um, uh, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber had written the first Scrum paper, which by the way, I did not understand, just to be honest about that. I thought they were hiding the goods. Literally, I saw the paper and I said, no, 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 no. You have to tell me what you're really doing. Like I literally didn't understand the words about like just make a backlog, you know, and work off the backlog and a month later show it. Like it, even though my methodology wasn't a lot different, I, I didn't understand the paper. In 96, 7, um, Kent Beck was on the Chrysler project, payroll project, and they were doing first drafts of extreme programming. Um, and so that was there. Jim Highsmith was at Nike and trying to figure out what they were doing. And he wrote that down in a book called Adaptive Software Development. The guys in Australia, some people were doing FDD, feature-driven development, and they, and, and, and they were writing that. And most remarkable to me, and I didn't know much about it, in um, England and the Netherlands, they were coming up with a DSDM, Dynamic Systems Development Method, you know, use what a mouthful. But, but the DSDM method, we, nobody knows about it, but it was brilliant. The reason nobody knows about it is they put it under lock and key, intellectual property control, all kinds of controls. And because it was so tightly controlled, nobody found out about it. But when we came down off the mountain, you know, like days or a week later, I, I looked at the nine principles of DSDM and I just went, we could have taken those exactly as written not, not a change that was it was all there they had everything there um client centricity incremental development prototyping risk reduction it was all there but anyway I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story so that's the thread that we know about right so uh scrum was represented with about three people at the meeting there were six people at the meeting from xp um, there was, we, we got John Kern to, to represent uh, FDD. I tried to get uh, Jennifer Stapleton, one of the organizers of the DSDM consortium. I had met her before. 
tried to get her to come, but there wasn't enough notice, so she couldn't come. So Ari van Benikum came. Um, so I wasn't concerned at that time with the you know gender diversity. I was concerned with international diversity. So we got Australia represented, Europe represented, and of course, you know, the U.S. represented. Uh, about, I don't know, a 98-99 time frame, the pragmatic programmers came out with their stuff, so they were there represented. So we had, and all of these people, all of these groups had done industrial strength projects in the 90s, mine 94-95, Scrum, and then, and then XP 97-98, that kind of time frame. So these were like industrial industrial usage, right? So there was no, we didn't have to make up stuff. We had been doing stuff for all of us for five, eight, ten years, whatever the number might have been. So that's the one thread, right? That's the lightweight methods that people know about that these things were being explored. What most people don't know was there was a network of conversations in different communities and as people would move from community to community, they would bring the memes and the social rules from the one to the other. And those two communities were the, the wood workshops and the patterns community. So the patterns community started in projects that are like 92 or something like that, because I already had the, the, the design patterns book, the Gang of Four Patterns in 93, because I was already working in IBM. So I saw them, you know, like in early stages. Um, and, and then they started at the University of Illinois at Atherton. They had 94, 95, the first patterns workshops, the writers workshops. And the thing that was so important about that was there's a, a manner of dialoguing they were experimenting with where you would do, instead of a peer review paper, you would workshop a paper. The author would be in the room. You'd give the author direct advice on how to improve. And there's a, there's a community, there are a lot of games being played, a lot of, you know, like, it was very human-centric, very conversation-oriented, very positive, like, fix, this is a brilliant pattern, but the author needs to fix this, right? So that, that practice, you'll see, showed up in the manifesto meeting, you know, 2001. So I attended that in 95, then it came out in Europe, so I went in 97, 98. So there were these twice a year. In Europe and in the US, there were these patterns writers workshop meetings. Um, and here we'll find, you know, guess what? Ward Cunningham, Ken Beck were amongst the founders. Martin Fowler was an early contributor. Jim Copeline, who didn't come to the meeting but might have, he was he was core in the patterns community. Mike Beadle, who was at the meeting, and by the way, you know, in a sense you might say represented, you know, Latin American people. Um, he was, he was deep in the, in the patterns community. He was writing patterns for Scrum with Jim Coplin. Uh, so the pattern community, co uh, the social context was very strong. And the third one is, uh, that was relevant is this wood W O O D workshop on object oriented design that was started by, uh, John Hopkins and John Hopkins, J O N H O P K I N S. Um, gets like like very little credit. So those of us who were there shout out his name every time. Very self-effacing. And in '94, um, uh, maybe even in '93, because I moved to Salt Lake in '93, I missed it. So I went to the first one I went to was in '94, and I went to '95. And he just liked to ski. You know, that's that's how Snowbird enters into the picture. So. And he knew, and he knew that the second week in February is the best ski week in in Utah, the, the, the middle week, which is, they're snowed in right now, right? So we're in that time period. And literally, I was up there last week for the, we had 11, 12, 13th of February. It was dry on, on Wednesday. Uh, it started snowing on Friday, and I scraped six inches of snow off the top of my roof on Friday scooted down the hill because they didn't want to get snowed in and they were snowed in on Saturday. So that's, and, and John knew that and he's a skier. And so he arranged these things. He said, let's just have a workshop about, you know, object oriented design stuff. And his invitation list was amazing. When, when I went there in 94, you know, I kind of sneaked in because I lived at the bottom of the mountain. Ivar Jakobsen was there, Agneta Jakobsen was there, Adele Goldberg and Kenny Rubin were there from the Small Talk book. 
Jim Rumbaugh was there, Larry Constantine was there, Lucy Lockwood was there, uh, Norm Kurth was there, Ward Cunningham was there, uh, Kent Beck was there, and I don't think Martin Fowler was there that first year. So you can see the quality of conversation that we had, and it started off, you know, like, who wants to put anything on the agenda? What are we going to talk about while we're here? So we'd construct an agenda, we'd run like one hour, two hour, half hour sessions, Morning conversation, skiing in the afternoon, evening conversation, dinner, right? Sit in the hot tub, whatever, and do that for two days or something like that. So, so that's not accidental. So we have that pattern. And since I organized the Agile meeting in Snowbird, I literally copied the Wood Conference because I was literally organizing that conference anyway. And we just like shifted the agenda to be, you know, for the manifesto. So that was in 94, 95. In, 90, um, in 98, I was in Norway. So shout out to all the people from Norway. I was working for Norges Bank in, in, in 97, 98. And um, it had been some years we hadn't done one of these. So I you know, wrote to Ward Cunningham and Rebecca Wirsbrock, right? Alan Wirsbrock, Jim Copeline, Kent Beck. I can't remember who all else was, was in those things. Now, Trygve Reinskau very significantly. And so I said, hey, let's do this on this, the, the, the boat, the mail boat, it's called the Hurtirute, in Norway, does all the fjords in Norway. And they have one, the biggest one is built up so you can have conferences on it. So, so we did a session where we did four fee, we did a one day talk in Oslo, a one day talk in Trondheim. Um, and we used the money to help pay people's airfares to come over and then everybody paid their own way on the ship. And we did, guess what? We did the same thing. So we had the meeting room, just like it was wood, 98, on the Hurte Ruta. And it's like, what do you want to talk about? You know, and everything was patterns and, and objects and incremental and XP. And those were the big topics of the time. So in 2000, I'm back in Salt Lake City and go, it's time to do the next wood workshop, right? It's going to be February of, 20, of 2001, second week in February. We're going to I'll just do wood. And I started collecting my invitee list, you know, the usual suspects, as they say. Um, and, and right about at that moment, Bob Martin um, wrote, and I did ask him, by the way, recently, directly, I said, why, why did you want to write a manifesto? And he said, and here's where you see the communities of conversations. He goes, he goes Martin Fowler and I were at a workshop, a group, a, a gathering for extreme programming. The week or two before, talking about creating a global community for XP, and the, and the crowd didn't want to create a global community. So we came back, and we were both living in, in Chicago at the time, and, and we're talking, and I go, well, we, we ought to try to do something, you know. So Bob Martin sent out this email to a bunch of people, like 30, 35 people, and he said, I think that a bunch of us kind of sound alike. I think there's something deeper underlying it, and I want to write a manifesto. So I asked them just last week when we were up there, I said, why manifesto? Like, that's a heavy word. I happen to hate manifestos. I thought it was stupid to write a manifesto. I was, you know, generally against writing manifestos. So you can see, like, how wrong I can be, and, and, and don't ever ask me to predict the future, because I'm about as wrong as you can ever be about the future. And But I thought he had some, like, he was really a manifesto guy, but he said, Manifesto is a nice word. We might as well write a manifesto. Like it wasn't a deep attachment. But anyway, so his invitation list was full of people like Grady Booch and Tom DeMarco and people that I didn't know. So his topic was better than my topic and his invitation list was better than my invitation list. Only he wanted to hold it in Chicago in February, which is just the worst place in the world. If you know what I mean, Chicago in February, it's just cold wind off Lake Michigan. and All you do is freeze and you can't even ski. So Jim Highsmith and I were in Salt Lake. So we kind of like, you know, Shanghai'd it. And I said, look, I'll organize it. We'll do it at Snowbird, et cetera. You know, so that's how we got to be Snowbird. So I set it up and I have to give a, a small shout out to Cutter Consortium. Jim Highsmith had just started working for them. And so they they helped sponsor it. You know, not a not a huge... Yeah, J.D. says, yeah, believe him, Chicago in February. Yeah, that's the worst month ever. Um, and so Cutter, you know, they, 
they they bought us all drinks the first night you know we didn't know each other and like what are we doing here and stuff so that was nice so shout out to cutter that they, they get credit for you know at least putting some money in the pot and and so now we get to the meeting right so we're all up there in snowbird and i'll pause right here sola are there any questions uh, i'm going to pick up the why no women at the at the end of the meeting because it that's when the answer makes sense but aside yeah, see, from that what do we have in, in twitter i see that rebecca Rustock tried to join but she couldn't because there was no space um there was a question let me see um, shout out to rebecca yes. i'll post a video you can see it hey can you ask her just on twitter to just ask any question or say whatever she wants yeah, in the I, I already posted the, the right. YouTube live. Everybody's is watching there. So uh, we have a question that says, uh, at which point, uh, what was the trigger that led you to the, there must be a better way, or was always a belief and your thoughts came together over time? Oh, that's interesting. So um, I knew nothing about methodology, like literally zero. And I was in the methodology department of the IBM consulting group. Um, and they had some uh, some guys from, the, they had somebody from um, Anderson Consult, the, and the big five, whatever. So they they had hired some execs from the big five. And I remember coming into a meeting room and this guy draws on the whiteboard like an ER diagram, boxes and arrows and stuff, and says, this is a, a method, this is a methodology, right? And so there were like 12 boxes and lines and you have roles and processes and work products and ceremonies and, you know, these, this is the definition of what is a methodology. And I go, I guess that's a methodology because everybody in the room just goes, sure, you know, and I'm the newbie on the block. So I believed that that was, that was a methodology and what I knew was nothing because the books just all disagreed. But the books were just how to draw boxes and arrows, except for Rebecca Wirfsbroff's book, which was, you know, do CRC cards and, you know, think about it, design a certain way. So, so um, Damon, I, there wasn't, I never thought there must be a better way. I literally, I started from a blank sheet of paper, right? None of this is my own. I want to be super clear about that. If you ever hear anybody say, you know, like whatever, Agile comes from Scrum, Agile comes from Lean, blah, blah, blah. They have to explain my history because I started from nothing. I literally, it's called Grounded Theory. I got my PhD in it. Um, and I sat with bits of paper on the floor looking for patterns. Like what, what did anybody say? And they just said this works and this doesn't work. And at the time I would ask them, what about computer-aided design tools? What about these processes? What about, right? And, and they would just go, so most people would say useless things like, I don't know, uh, we just didn't use them. But I found one person, one project, and they said, we tried it with the case tools and without the case tools, and we found we went faster without the case tools. So I had one like serious data point where they said, we, it's faster without, right? And I, and, and I got all of those things, right? But, but basically, anybody who was doing anything, and there was literally no way to talk about this in 92, 93, they would be, it would be like, I don't know, there's three of us. No, I had a guy, the guy in New Zealand with the, with the mainframe, I think it was called Sapien, the reflective database system thing. He was very clear. He said, if you let me have four people in one room, and access to the customers, I will guarantee you a successful project. If you push on me, I'll accept two rooms with four people each, so eight people total. If you need more than eight people, I'm out. Like, I, I don't know how to do it. So get somebody else and you won't succeed anyway, but I'm not touching it, right? So I got like one person super clear about the, the human, you know, conversation, the size, what, what I came to call osmotic communication. But anything that was in the literature, nobody referred to. Like there was just a giant silence. It was just put people in a room and let them talk to each other. End. Which, by the way, you know, actually works, by the way. So, yeah. Um, um, and then I lived off the stories. And literally my first book, Surviving Object-Oriented Projects, is just bunches of stories. You read it. The stuff just works. You know, we were on that project in 94, 95. And stuff was going wrong. And, and, and at the beginning... You know, I would say, well, you know, we're all staring at each other like, I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? We'd, none of us knew anything. We'd never seen any of this before. 
And so I would say, um, well, I heard a story because I had been like talking to like everybody I could talk to. I heard a story. They said, blah, 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 blah. We did blah, blah. I go, how about we try that? So we tried it and it worked. And then, and then I did that for months. And then eventually I stopped saying I heard a story and I just said, how about we just do this, right? That's how you know I became a consultant at that moment because I just started giving advice instead of telling the story. Now I've reverted these days. I don't give the advice. I only tell the stories and it's actually works even better because then you just say, I don't know. I heard a story where blah, 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 and the people go, that's right. I can do that. And you don't have to ever like you don't have to ever take accountability for giving advice. You just tell stories and it is the, the bestest ever way to consult. And that's the way I consult these days is just find stories and let people draw their own conclusions. Um, so, yeah, ever, there, there was no better way, Damon. It was just 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 follow the path. Just believe what the people say. Try it out and it works. And and then what I as you guys, some of you guys um, know the difference between me and other people is my my dad was a scientist. So. I, I, I keep trying to like work out why does this work or not why does this work? Why should we believe that this works, right? So why is it you put three people, six people in a room and it works, you know, and that's osmotic communication, trust, close community, frequency, contact, facial expressions, right? So since 91, 92, I've been trying to decode why do these things work and all of my writings are about like, like here's the story and here's like why you could believe that it could work and then you try to build the science up like out of that. So that's my history. Um, let me see. How long, I'm looking at the chat, Sola. How long does talk about good practice take from beginning to end in a meeting on Utah? We talk about good practice. Reynaldo Barros. How long does talk about good practices? Well, we'll, we'll talk about Utah. Um, Three spots open, see if we can get Rebecca in. Um, we'll talk about the past two decades after because, you know, a lot of people can talk about the last two decades. Very few people can talk about the 90s. So I, I really want to give a shout out to all the people in the 90s who are building this stuff up. Um, let's, if it's okay, jump to the manifesto meeting. Yes, please. Yep. So the manifesto meeting, so so uh, the key thing, and, and on this cup, on this cup here, is written the top sentence that says increase the quality of listening and that sentence comes here because I asked myself literally for like 10 years why did the meeting work because it shouldn't have right you have 17 men with egos published books methodologies competitors we even had Stephen Meller there and he was the enemy so there was like no way um, that this thing should have worked and so why did it work and, 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 and here's where I can hope that maybe the influence from the patterns, the writer's workshop came in. So we were practiced in dialing in a certain way, but we had people who didn't know each other at all. So there should have been fights and why were there no fights? And, and all I can say, it's a key phrase, is, is there was the most generous listening in the room that I've ever seen in my entire life. I've been part of four or five manifesto writing workshops and everybody scratched themselves to death. It was just cat scratching from beginning to end. But we didn't get anywhere. So let's take a look at the people in the room. As I said, six people from XP, three from Scrum. And then we had, you know, one of all these other people. Well, one of the people was Stephen Meller. Okay, so Stephen Meller was in the enemy camp. I have no idea how he got invited. He shouldn't have been there by all rights. He was, you know, designated enemy number like one, two, three, four, five. We knew who our enemies were, by the way. You can see them in the manifesto. Um, Project Management Institute, PMI, with all of its get back to plan. Um, CMI, with all its process, CMMI level one, two, three, to five, all that stuff. Rational Unified Process, with all of its tool focus. We knew who the enemies were, and, and amongst them was Steve Mellon, right? So he was the other guy, tools and drawings. So we get there, we see Steve there, and we're all going like, Oh my God, like who let this guy in the room? Like, Bob, what was on your invitation list? What, why did you let this guy in? So he, we introduced, but nobody says anything. And that's the amazing part, right? And we introduce ourselves and he says, hi, I'm Stephen Meller and I'm a spy. Just like that. And we all just like stare at him like he just said it. 
okay, here we go, right? Like literally like, like yeah, roll with it, right? But that, that's the moment you see that the listening was turned on, right? The egos were, the trust, there was some sort of honoring people that was there. And this is super important. And, and, and when I was talking actually with him last week, you know, we had the Scrum Alliance did a big a, a video with the six of us, seven of us they could collect. And literally I told him this and asked him this story, right? So, so we've already gone, gone through this. There was a moment where, where Ron Jeffries and I were talking to Stephen Miller, right? And so what, if there's anything we agreed on was don't use Stephen Miller's tech methodology because you draw drawings and you push buttons and you don't push buttons and you end up with code and like we, we couldn't stand all these drawings. And so we're talking to him and, and Ron's going like, like, what's on your mind with all these drawings? And Stephen Miller says, well, my end, my end game is that the drawings are going to be the source code. You will, you will program with these drawings and you'll push a button and all the code will come out. And Ron says, uh, yeah, but, but then you have to maintain the code. That's no good because then the code's out of date with the drawings. And Stephen says, no, 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 no. When I, when I get done, you'll be able to maintain the drawings, the drawings and the code. It, it'll be the source code. You won't have to do anything else. So Ron and I look at each other and go, well, I don't care what the source language is. If it's drawings and text, it's just as good for me as if it's text. As long as I do my, my evolution there, I don't, it's good for me. And at that moment, we were all on the same side of the table. At that moment, uh, the tease was, because I did this with Stephen last week, and I said, Stephen came over to the, our side of the table, right? And Stephen said, no, 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 you all came to my side of the table, right? And But... But yeah, no, the light shone and we were all on the same side of the table. We didn't have a disagreement. He had a research program that, that, that he was in the process of. And when we saw what his end, end goal was, we literally had no more disagreements after that. So, so that's the kind of generous listening um, that was phenomenal. There was one other one um, where we were doing the principles and I was um, standing in front of a, one of the principles and it says, Deliver working software every few weeks to every few months with a preference for the former. And the reason I remember that, because I was standing there with Ward Cunningham, and, and I had a rule, every team has to deliver working software every three months. Cannot go longer than three months because of, you know, energy, focus, feedback, all that stuff. And XP were doing, and here's what, I didn't catch the, the word difference. They were using iterations and I was using deliveries, but they didn't have to deliver after every iteration. So... They were doing iterations every three weeks, but they weren't delivering every three weeks, right? But I didn't catch that. So Ward is standing there, and I go, no, every three months. And, and I know he thought I was crazy at that moment. Like, Alistair's lost it, because you, you would never, in XP, try to go three months without delivering stuff. Um, and, and he said, are you... He just goes like, but would you agree that there's a preference to the weeks instead of the months? And I go... Sure, I, of course. I just say there's a bottom line, don't go past three months. And he goes, okay. So we made that adjustment, right? So, but that's the manner. You see the gentleness of that dialogue, right? And, and that was key, beginning to end. All right, now we'll do the process of, of what happened. So now you have the attitude. You can, you can a little bit foresee how it's going to roll forward. So we get there, and, and I'm expecting what I call cat scratching when you get a bunch of people meeting for the first time, and everybody has, how are we doing the agenda? How much time do we planning? When do we start working, right? Whose ideas do we use? That's, it's normal, and, and you can get locked up for a whole day, you know, or forever. And it never happened. So we circle 17 people, and, and, and somebody says, oh, no, 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 I, I, I should back up. Um, so Bob Martin got up at the beginning, Smart guy, he says, um, I called you here. This is, uh, I, I think there's something here. Rising, uh, what did it say? Rising tide raises all boats, right? So we have some differences, but I believe there's something in common. I think it'd be good to write a manifesto, right? And then he sat down, which is really important with this group that you don't try to control these people, right? He sat down. Good. So we're sitting, 17 people around a circle, and somebody says, uh, so how do we build an agenda? And the extreme programming guys always had index cards in their pockets. And we had six of them there, right? So social mass matters. So one of them pulls the cards out of their pocket and they say, just write it on a card. All you XP people know they always said, just write it on a card. That's a key phrase. 
So all the all the XP people pull cards out of their various pockets and start writing stuff and throwing it in the center of the circle. You know, and then and then the other people like the scrum guys and the DSDM guys who don't know anything, they go, uh, "Can I have a card?" Right. And so then they everybody's writing. Mm -hmm. But you see, we got past this cat scratching because it was a social mass and so we had good listening, right? So we end up with a pile of cards on the floor. And then somebody says, uh, how do we make an agenda out of that? And then somebody says, um, anybody who cares about the agenda, stick around and make an agenda. And anybody who doesn't care, take a coffee break, right? And I don't care, so I took a coffee break. I have no idea what happened. I came back in the room and all the cards were glued to the, you know, taped to the glass. And, and you'll notice I will keep saying somebody said and somebody said, because nobody knows who said what. And that's the, the brilliant thing about all of this. And what was super fun was like, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes later or sometime later, somebody says, hey, how do I um, add something to the agenda? Right? And somebody else says, who's added to the agenda? And I do remember this face, this guy like, can I do that? And, and then whoever it was wrote, whatever it was, and put it wherever they put it on the agenda. And it was on the agenda. I have no idea. I didn't pay any attention at all. So we had a thing on the agenda. Right. So that's the kind of meeting we had going. So, okay, we decided, all right, first thing, everybody has to get 10 minutes, um, you know, describe their methodology. So Ari von Benekum didn't know anything about XP. Kent Beck said about XP. And Ari von Benekum understood like nothing. And then Ari von Benekum under described DSDM, and Kent Beck didn't know about DSDM, and he like understood nothing, and and then yeah, everybody took a turn. And then Jim Highsmith and I were, were our ideas were so closely aligned. He, he was pushing adaptive, and I was pushing crystal, and, and our uh, our our stuff was different than the others because we believed that every project should have its own different methodology. And that was different because XP was our methodology, Scrum is our methodology, the SDM is our methodology. We and we thought that it should always be different, um, and so they they couldn't tell us apart literally. So we literally had to split our ten minutes. They said we don't know what's the difference between Alistair and Jim, so you guys can split your ten minutes. So I got five minutes to talk about Crystal, and he got five minutes to talk about um, Adaptive, right? So we did that. That's fine. And then and at the end you go, well that's all that's all nice. I, I guess there's something in common. We probably need a word. But what do we call this thing? Because lightweight processes like wasn't really doing it for us, you know, as you could imagine. And and I facilitated the name search, right? We all took turns facilitating different parts of the meeting, and that's the one I facilitated. So I, I happen to remember something about that. We got up a split flip charts and just brainstorm names. That's why it doesn't matter who who came up with the name Agile, the adaptive. There was I got I have no idea. We had columns of names and then somebody said um, uh, we should maybe try a technique from Jerry Weinberg and and say what we don't like about some of the words right so it's really interesting and not obvious that's that turns out to be a, a significant thing so we'd pick a, a, a one out and say why don't you like this word and, and it does it's not a veto against the word we're just trying to find out what what is inside your head that you don't like and, and the thing that, the only one I remember that popped up, right, remember I have 17 men in the room, 17 middle-aged men in the room. And at one point, there was some fluffy, some light fluffy word, and, and somebody says, I don't want to have to wear pink tights and a tutu when I say this word. And, and that just became the refrain. Every time we would pick out a word that was a little bit, you know, like, like, like soft and light, the person, somebody would say, pink tights and tutu can't do it, right? And and so that was, so so that like cut out some other words anyway. So we did that, what we don't like. And then we went back and did a dot vote on all of the words. We got it down to five. So we figured we'll take it down to five. We'll do a second round. We did the second round. And here the surprise was we had a tie between adaptive and agile. And that's significant because um, I, I think you need both words. And, and talking with Jim Highsmith, who lived in Salt Lake at the time, I, I view Agile as tracking rapidly changing requirements within a project. I think of that as agility. And adaptive is changing culture more slowly, but to fit the cultural landscape needed to deal with the different projects. So I think you have to have Agile and adaptive. 
and we would see that that um, in this sense uh, XP is is agile but not adaptive at least XP version one and anybody who here thinks they know what XP is um, my bet is that you're locked on to XP version one and not XP version two right K just nod your head K this is a good time to nod your head thank you very much um, and and because because hey Jean and and Jean's an old XP guy there you are we got you um, so XP is is agile but not adaptive and the rational unified process is adaptive but not agile right so so Jim Highsmith and I wanted both agile and, and, and adaptive in, in all of the things and, and we could have taken the one or the other right so we had a discussion we had adopt we had another vote agile came out above adaptive we went okay there's that now I have no memory about the timing like it's it's a, it was a two and a half day meeting and I don't know when the breaks were but obviously we went skiing in the afternoon um, so there was skiing in the afternoon and, and, right and nighttime and I and I don't know exactly when the shifts were so the next thing was okay we have a word that's cool agile that's a nice word what, what does it mean like what, what does it do right and and that must have happened um, just before skiing because uh, I went skiing we had nice conversations you know that stuff you get private room conversation on the lift so Jim and I had talked so the big skiers were John Kerr and James Grinning um, Jim Highsmith me and I can't remember who else was a skier so we had a little private conversations up on the lift you know what do you think about where are we going what do we aspire to da 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 and down below everybody else was working on on the um, you know whatever whatever came next right so we came back down and and I suspect it was about that point that we you know we came in and we saw this over that so it was after lunch break anyway uh, and and everybody recognized that a this over that was was a good structure and 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 here's where we see the patterns community again because this was a it's a very non-confrontational group how do you do yes and right how do you yes and things and so this over that that's useful but this is more useful comes that language comes out of these communities of, of conversation I, I do believe uh, my suspicion Right, but then we had to workshop it because you have 17 people and like everybody's got a different view or they're three or they're five or they're seven, how many are they gonna be? Um, and and, and here's, where, here's where it got really remarkable because I, I remember we had the whiteboard in front, 17 people in a kind of a horseshoe. I would say, so what do you think about that, right? And then people would be, you know, like this. And you could go for consensus, right? But we decided to go for unanimity. So not that we decided to, it just was the listening that was in the room. You know, so we go to the first sentence and so how does everybody feel about that? And somebody would be, you know, like this and they'd say, so what bothers you about that? And they say, well, that bothers me because something or the other. And then we would all problem solve and try to find words that would fix that person's right difficulty like that. And we did that all the way through. And I remember my particular one was it said, Working software over documentation, and, and and I raised my hand. I can't I can't do that. Literally, I cannot go from the room, and say working software over documentation. You have to have documentation. It's part of the game, and and the best we got was the comprehensive, right? So I I yielded and I said, okay, that's not perfect, but it's good enough to that I can defend it, right? I can I can go with that. So we went through, and then there's this moment where we've gone gone through everything. And, and we all look at each other and we go, okay, so what do you think about the whole thing? And it's like 17 thumbs straight up in the air. And like we're all staring at each other because this is an unimaginable result that we had literally 100% agreement on every single word in there. And it was mind boggling, to be honest, right? So we did that and then, and then things started to unravel a bit. Um, Ari had to go back to the Netherlands and you know, people had planes and we said, okay, what else is there? Like if you want to dig, we have values, that's nice. It's a value statement, it's beautiful, it's still a bit vague. Um, are there any principles behind it? So then we had a workshop and we had you know, one on each flip chart and people going around and doing things. But, but frankly, we still disagreed, right? We disagreed on a day-to-day -day stuff and we couldn't get to unanimity and people were getting on airplanes. And that's when it was, you know, me and, and, and um, uh, Ward Cunningham doing the three weeks versus months thing, right? And so we didn't finish it. We didn't finish it. And then we tried to finish it over email. But man, if you can't finish it face to face, you're for sure not going to finish it over email. 
So at some point, somebody said, pull the plug, you know, publish whatever. And I have no idea what the second or the last version was versus the last version. Um, yeah, so then we had now, so that's the meeting, right? So that's the meeting and, and, and the name and the values and the principle. And, and the last thing to say was we had a, a recap at the very end. We go like, that was amazing, and why did it work? And we said, well, because we had individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We were face-to-face, -face, like we were really digging into this together, stuff like that. Um, but what was significant then was the question was, hey, what do we call ourselves, right? Because we're going to put this out so people can sign it. And Ward Cunningham created the website that people could not only sign, they could write a phrase, and that's what we learned Within a couple of weeks, you know, hundreds of people had signed and written phrases about it. So, so we really knew that we had touched a chord globally. There was a global hunger for this, and we'd, we'd, we'd found something. Um, so we thought, I guess, we're the authors. So we're not the co-signatories. We're the co-authors of the manifesto, and everybody who signed gets to sign it so that everybody can be a signatory. The other thing that becomes super important, as we said, do we update it or not? Right? You people ask the question, do you, are you going to up, ever update this? And, and, and in a sense, you know, it would be, it would be good to, to touch it up, but we can't. Okay? And that was the discussion. We said, look, there were like 35 people invited and other people who could have been here that weren't invited. Um, somebody who was here might not have made it. You know, it would have been different if anybody, any, if anybody else had been different. It would have been different. It would have been 100% different. Just change one body. Everything would have been different. So we can never change it. Like we had a discussion at a moment in time. This is a snapshot of whatever's on our mind. And exactly these people in the room, we came up with exactly these words. This can't be updated because it'll be a different construct, a different conversation to get anybody, anybody together again in the future. So we decided when you say, you know, update it, we decided can't, right? So you can update the Constitution of the United States, but you can't update the Declaration of, Ind of, of Independence, right? So... So we said it's this, it's a, it's, a, it's a moment in time, it's a snapshot of a discussion, it's what we got, it does not get updated. Now I, now I get to pick up the question of, of why were there no women in the room and what would have happened if there were women in the room. So I invite, I invite people to think about who were the published women in lightweight methodologies in 1999. And you get basically Rebecca Wurzbrock. So she was in the word, the the the, the wood conferences. Here, she's listening to you. I know she's here. Hi, Rebecca. Where are you? Show your face. Rebecca, say something so that the screen gets centered. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, it is Rebecca. Everybody, a round of applause for Rebecca. Hey. Thank you. Yeah, Rebecca, I told them that, like, I studied your book from 1991 or 92, and that was, like, what I learned from and wrote about, and you were in the, uh, uh, the, the, you were in the wood workshops. Were you ever in the patterns workshops? You must have been. No, I actually was a latecomer to the patterns community, uh, mm -hmm. and my first patterns I wrote in 2006. Oh, wow. I was just doing things. Yeah. And another influence about that collaborative style is definitely shepherding and experience reports and things like that at the Oops Law Conference. So the object community had that. Yeah, and the, right. Life. And I was talking about communities of conversations and networks of conversation, how both <laughs> memes and social norms move between them, right? So there was a close linkage between the patterns community and the Uppsala uh, community. So I'm still in the patterns community, and I'm still in the agile community, and I'm still in the design community, and I'm in the DDD community. So, yeah. 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 All right. Don't so, be defined by one thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. So, so the question about the women, right? So... Um, as far as I know, only two women were published in the in the lightweight methodologies, and that was Adele Goldberg. She co-wrote the book with um, Kenny Rubin and kind of got out, so she didn't stay in the conversation. And Rebecca, who's been in the conversation like before I got there, Mary Poppendy came later. Uh, 2003 was her first book in the first Agile conference, so, so she came later. Uh, we had Mar um, Martine DeVos in the patterns community in Europe, but she wasn't published. She could have been there. Bob Martin didn't know about it. We did invite um, Jennifer 
Um, yeah, JD, remember Schleyer and, and, and Meller were our enemies. So we, I don't think that, that, that Bob would have invited um, Sally Schleyer, right? We, we got Bob Meller. Um, and, and Jennifer Stapleton uh, couldn't make it. So if you have like the four people, um, Rebecca, if, if I had been doing the invitation list, would have been on the, the you know, usual suspects list. And I didn't know she wasn't there. And uh, Jennifer Stapleton couldn't make it. And that was about it. But now, but now interestingly, I'm going to shift over and say, so, so why, would you, why would you want women as well as men? You know? um, and, and it's very stereotypical, right? So, so the stereotypical response, and I'm going to live off of that here for a minute, because I think it actually makes sense, is generally speaking, men don't listen to each other, right? Generally speaking, men all speak and they don't listen. And what you aspire to, in a sense, by adding women to the mix is they're going to they're gonna listen and they're going to generate some kindness and, and listening to that. And, and the thing is, we had the most generous listening there. So adding more women, even with good listening, um, is, is, it wouldn't have changed the listening. The listening was good. Hey, do you ski, Rebecca? I can't remember. Did you ski at the wood conferences? Yeah, I would go out and uh, ski with Adele. We went on diamond slopes, nearly killed ourselves, but it was a lot of fun. Cool, cool. Very good. So that wouldn't have changed that. And the last question is, would the output have been different? And the answer is yes, because we already said that if you changed even one person, the output would have been, would have been really, really, really different. Um, so yeah, the output put the, the, the result would have been different if we'd had, had any women there because the dialogue would have been different from the beginning to the end. So that's what I have to say uh, on the women topic. And um, I'm going to go for like another 10 minutes, uh, but let's see what we've got for questions. Um, we have some questions uh, on the same direction as what happened if uh, there were women there. Um, this one I, you would like, what doors did the Agile Manifesto open and that you didn't expect? That's a, I, yeah, I guess, hmm, 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 ah, hmm. Okay. Well, I thought that, you know, the, I, what's missing for me is the reflective improvement, right? So we had four values, and, and those of you who know my writing, I, I have three things, which is close communication, frequent delivery, and reflective improvement. Um, and the reflective improvement part didn't show up until the, um, the, pen, the principles. Uh, here's another thing. If you guys ever get the authors of the manifesto, uh, any of them in the room, ask them which principle they didn't actually like, because we did not get unanimity on the, on the principles. And I can, I can tell you there were, there were two that just bothered me, but you know, I couldn't, I couldn't close them out. One is, one is um, welcoming uh, requir late changing requirements even late in the project. I want to just be on record. I do not welcome late changing requirements late in the project. It, I, don't, I do not welcome them, right? If I'm on the implementation side, I want everything nice and still. Fixed price, fixed contract, right? Fixed requirements. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, I know better than that, right? So I set up a project to absorb the, the, the requirements that come late, but not because I want them. Right. Just so, you know, that one. And the thing about self-organizing teams produce the best designs in emergent design. Yeah, I just, you know, I just not I'm not all about that. I don't know that that's true. And emergent and emergent is is a funny word because in physics, emergent has weird things like unpre fundamentally unpredictable different properties. Right. So I, I that I can't live off of that word. Um, however, emergent in, in English also means like appears slowly like out of a fog, right? So, so a car emerges from the fog. So I could say that when you start designing, there's a fog, right? And the design emerges like from a fog, but that's not what an emergent property of a system is. So those are the two that kind of gave me heartburn, still do. Um, and, and people ask, what will you change? We got burned so badly from um, uh, responding to change over following the plan. And I just have to tell you what was the conversation around that. The conversation is that doing the planning, planning is a valuable activity because everybody's projecting into the future and you're trying to find problems and it's a mind merge where you try to find the things that, you know, that you can spot and that's useful. 
And then you write it down and then, you know, reality hits and plans don't last typically more than a week or two before they go bad. And it's a famous dictum in, 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 in the military, right? Um, that, that plans, no plan survives contact with the enemy, right? So planning is useful, the plan is not. The way we wrote it is responding to change over following the plan. So and everybody, all, the, all the, the people who hate planning, all the programmers tell the bosses, I don't have to plan because it's agile. And to me, that's wrong. You have to be better at planning. You have to do it more frequently. You have to get faster and quicker at it, right? Because you're going to have to do more of it. If it goes out of week, if it goes out of out of um, out of context every two weeks, you you basically have to replan every two weeks, kind of a thing. Um, what else? That's all about that. And then um, I, I'm going to scan. Yes, we have some similar. I'm scanning. Um, um, yeah, I, you know, um, oh, okay, it was about software, and is it still about software? So it was about software, right? We, we were literally trying to get permission to put software out the door, and we were being told we couldn't because we had all these, do all these funny processes. So, so the stuff about customer value, we knew about customer value. XP is about customer value. Ward knew it. Kent knew it. Martin knew it. I knew it, right? It's a lot of people. We knew about customer value. The, the thing is about working software is stuff breaks. You rely on stuff breaking. It doesn't matter how optimistic you are when your code breaks. It gives you information you can't get any other way. And so um, uh, uh, Henry, no, what's his, Henry Kneeberg in Sweden said working value. I think he just put the word value there instead of software. And responding to change, he said responding to feedback. And if you just change those two words, you're you're out of software. So a couple, you know, like six months later, I'm at Jim Highsmith's house, and he says, "Hey, you recognize that this has nothing to do with software, especially, right?" And I go, "Yeah, right." So we've been literally trying since mid '91 to take this out of software. I just want to focus on things that I want to put in the record that you can't get elsewhere. Um, besides. Besides, in 2015, I was challenged to, to simplify everything, and I came up with the four words, collaborate, deliver, reflect, and improve. So you basically get all of that, and people like Chet Hendrickson now. The Agile Manifesto is really long for, and long-winded for 2020, 2021 time frame. Um, so, so Chet Hendrickson actually literally introduces uh, Agile through the four words, collaborate, deliver, reflect, improve. And you see, I put on here that, that lesson from the manifesto, increase the quality of listening, right? Other things, and deliver small and soon. So, so when you take it out of software, um, as we're doing these days in the heart of agile work, you, you need other language. You, 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 can't, you can't write, say, even product. So what do you do? So I, I go to the decisions. The organization is a giant brain making decisions in, in, a, in a network of decisions that looks a lot like a manufacturing flow line has the same network properties so you can apply all of Toyota production system to the network of decisions flowing through an organization. People make mistakes at the rate of like one in five, one in ten at making decisions and that starts from the very first strategic statement about the initiative. So we talk about initiatives, we talk about decisions. Um, everything you deliver to the world is a product of those decisions and we've got lots of errors in them so we need to touch the world often early and often to get feedback on the decisions to find out where we're wrong in all the things so 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 that's uh, how the language that we use now in the heart of agile to talk about these things in all domains not just software um, and and i have to say compulsory compulsory ad for our next course which will be in um march um, we have a three half day uh, Heart of Agile Fundamentals in which we'll do the Carpaccio. We can't do the draw the drawing exercise for those of you who know it, but we boiled it down to like we can't boil it any anymore. We actually had it as a two half day and we found we took too much out. We had to put stuff in. Um, so we have a three half day that'll be middle of March. You guys can find that in the chat. And we'll do all the um, totally not connected to software language, just everything org change, social impact projects, you know, churches, families, government, you know, and that's where we are now. Let me see. 
Ah, the last thing I have to talk about, everybody gets upset about certificates and certifications. So I have to talk about that. Um, I have a, a dictum that says that uh, your idea will either get corrupted or ignored. You have, and you don't get to choose. So if you have a good idea and it gets adopted, anybody who sees a power advantage will corrupt it. They'll co-opt it. They'll misquote it. They'll misuse it. They'll misrepresent it. That's called success. The alternative is that nobody knows you exist. So I've written like three or four manifestos. Nobody ever corrupts those ones because you don't even know they exist. So I've been, I've been safe, right? So what happened, you know, Ken Schwaber came up with this thing, Certified Scrum Master. It's a lovely title. People started doing it. Exec saw that they could power, could power moves on each other by having more Scrum Masters than the other guy, right? And then we're off to the races and now there's, you know, um, certificate inflation all over the place um, and, and what well, by the way for the heart of agile we started an academy and we still give certificates but we've decided there are no certified role names anywhere in the university anywhere in, in, in our stuff so um, for example there's a certified agile marketing specialist and 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 we offer the course in the academy but we can't put the certified so it's just um, agile marketing Right? You can you can deepen your skills in facilitation, collaboration, and delivery in Kanban, right? All these things. It's skills based, but no, no certified X. So certified X then started the wars and then people co-opted, corrupted, right, misquoted, misused. Um, and I don't mind that because that's just the world saying it was a good idea. Right. And so one day, the, the reason nobody is corrupting Heart of Agile is because no, not enough people are using it yet. The moment the moment it gets, you know, see people see how to get a power advantage out of that. We're going to see how they corrupt it. Right. That's that's what we got. Hey, gang, you've been super patient. Yes. We have picked any, up questions. I just talked literally. Now, somebody asks, what are your thoughts about the future of software development? Since we know I can't predict the future because I didn't like writing a manifesto, I cannot give you any thoughts about the future except whatever I say will be wrong. Okay, okay you just answer the question I was going to ask. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, with that, I think that we've really used up, I have used up our time. Yes, we must... Uh, 15 minutes or I know, but these guys are nice. Yes. They are and besides, we should recording it so other people can see it. And we'll trim out the beginning. Yes. So thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you very much for everybody for attending. Uh, we'll be posting this and we will deliver um, the recording to the Agile Festival so they can upload it as well. So have a good day, night, whatever part of the world you are, <laughs> and uh, see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, Bye. Wash your hands. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> Be safe, everyone. Thank you bye -bye. for the great. So, thank you. Thank bye, you. Alistair. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye, 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 Take care, everybody. Thanks. I'm watching all the all the chats going. See y'all. Okay. Heart of Angel hug. That's a heart. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot to uh, take a picture of everybody. Do it now, quick. Do it with the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, those who stayed on. I, I need to unpin you. There you go. I took pictures, lady. I I can send you. Put them oh, on Twitter. You. Put them on Twitter. How can I send? How can I send? Okay. Yeah, you can, yeah, put it up on Twitter or you can send me to. Yeah. Hey, Twitter. we didn't do a hashtag for this. It doesn't matter. It's all good. Yeah, somebody, I was paying attention to all social media, but I couldn't do all this. Hey, Michael in Salt Lake City. I was there two days ago. All right, I'm going to get off. Yeah, I'm going to finish this. Thank you. Bye. Bye.